17 adventure novels for children. And these novels, again, except for, I think, four or five, the others rest all of the background is set in the Northeast. Now, I think I'm running out of words. Uh, whether I'm running out of time, I do have absolutely no idea. But no, what? You have, you have enough time. You please carry on. We are enjoying listening to you, sir. <laughs> uh, what your principal, Mrs. Bahadur, had said, I'll just speak a few words about adding to that. She had talked about the power of words to activate imagination. I think she has hit the nail on the head. Why do you need literacy? You need literacy because it acquaints you with words. And words are the most powerful tool in mankind to activate what is known as the creative imagination. And it is my belief that every individual in some form or the other has that creative spark within herself or himself. Everybody has a creative spark. That creative spark finds different ways to manifest itself. Even a carpenter making a table is using that creative spark. But this thing is intangible. For instance, I'll just give you two examples. One is that of Isaac Newton. He was sitting under an apple tree and apple fell down. And if it had been you or I, we'd have picked up the apple and simply gobbled it up. But it set Isaac Newton's creative imagination working. And he thought about gravity. Now, gravity is something that you cannot eat, you cannot taste, you cannot smell, but it exists. And it was this creative imagination which had enabled Isaac Newton to visualize an intangible reality such as gravity. Or for that matter, another scientist, Thomas Alva Edison. One day, Edison was missing. The young Edison was went missing. And everybody searched for him and ultimately discovered in him in the hen coop, sitting on a clutch of eggs. This young boy was trying to find out whether if a hen sits on the eggs, then the eggs hatch into chicklings. He was find, wondering whether if he sat on the eggs, those chicklings would come out of the eggs. Now, everybody thought he was an idiot, but you and I know that his creative imagination at work his curiosity, inquisitiveness was at work, and he had been able to grasp a concept which today is something extremely familiar to all of us. That is uh, artificial incubation. Anyway, I don't think I'll proceed on this theme much further. I'll just give you one anecdote in my life, which I think was a game changer. That was when I was around six or seven years old. Our class teacher had asked, the, that time I was studying in Jorhat, in a small school. And our class teacher had asked us to write a brief paragraph on some visit to some place he had made. And I wrote about a visit to Shillong. That's a hill station of the Northeast. Now, our teacher was very impressed with my essay. And next day, she read out the essay in front of the class, saying that, look, 
Arup had gone to Shillong. He had observed the Shillong scenery and he has written it so well after what, about what he had observed. And I told the teacher, Madam, I have never been to Shillong. And that is when she said, oh, then I think you'll become a writer one day. And perhaps her words are prophetic. And today, I'm happy to be able to call myself a writer. Thank you. Now, I've been also asked to read out uh, some passages from my book, The Kajiranga Trail, which was already shown on the screen, I think. Uh, should I do that now? Yes, please. I'll read the foreword first. The rhinoceros is the second biggest animal in India, next only to the elephant. It looks ugly, which is tough skin, stout body, and thick, powerful legs. The rhino has a horn on its snout. It is not really horn or bone, but tufts of hair matted together into a hard substance. The horn grows from the flesh, and if it breaks, another grows in its place. Some people believe that rhino horn has medicinal properties. It is, therefore, in great demand and bought at fabulous prices. The rhino is herbivorous. It spends long hours grazing in the open fields or in the shallow waters of a pond or a lake. It seldom attacks other animals and they too leave the rhino alone because of its bulk, brute strength and forbidding appearance. Even the tiger keeps out of its way. The rhino bothers no one, and no one bothers it. But it does have an enemy, man. It is man alone who kills animals, not only for food, but for pleasure and gain. He has killed so indiscriminately that some animals have ceased to exist and some others are in danger of becoming extinct. Steps have, therefore, been taken to protect wildlife. Large tracts of forest land have been declared protected areas. The Kaziranga Wildlife Sanctuary on the south bank of the Great Brahmaputra River in Assam is one such. Here there are rhinos, elephants, tigers, deer, and a host of other wild animals. In spite of all the care taken by the forest authorities, poachers break the law and catch or kill wild animals for money. Chapter 1, The Poachers The silence of the night was broken by the sounds of an animal struggling to get out of the trap it had fallen into. The men who set the trap were hiding in a shelter by the side of a small lake nearby. They heard the sounds. Their leader came out and listened to make sure they had caught the right animal. He turned to his companions with a cruel smile. We have got him, he said. We have got the rhino. They were a gang of poachers in the Kajiranga Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam. There were six of them, strong and hefty men. They were familiar with the rhino's habits. It always takes the same route and drops its dung at the same place. The poachers had watched those movements of a rhino for a few days. When they were sure of the path it took, they dug a deep pit near the dung heap and covered it with strips of bamboo, mud, and grass. 
Then they built a shelter for themselves at a safe distance and waited for the animal to fall into the trap. The frightened grunts and snores told them that their waiting was over. They moved swiftly and silently through the tall elephant grass in the direction of the sound. The grunts grew louder as they neared the pit. The leader of the gang spat out commands and the others obeyed him. One of the poachers carried torches made of hollow bamboo tubes, stuffed with rags soaked in kerosene. He stuck them round the pit and lit them. The lighted torches might attract the forest guards, but this was a risk they had to take. The rhino trapped in the pit looked big in the dim light. It plowed its head repeatedly into the walls of the pit. The poachers laughed at the futile efforts of the frightened beast. Each of them knew his job. With pieces of strong rope, they made lassos and passed them over the rhino's snout, neck, and legs. The rhino fought with all his strength. But the men were experts and soon had the ropes all around the animal's body. The ends of the ropes were tightly fastened to iron spikes driven deep into the ground. The leader of the gang moved into action. He took a dow and climbed down the pit. The rhino sensed his coming but was helpless. The man landed on his back. He lifted the dow and began to hack away at the animal's snout to remove the horn. The rhino cringed in pain. Blood spouted from the snout like a fountain. The man went on hacking. After a while, he stopped and picked up the horn, covered with flesh and blood. He held it up for the others to see. Then he climbed out. His hands were bloody. On his face was a triumphant, fiendish smile. The poacher's work was over. They put out the torches and left as quietly as they had come. The rhino stood in the pit, life ebbing out of its body. By morning, it would be dead. Vultures would swoop down to feed upon its carcass. Thank you. Thank you. A very, very moving, uh, moving paragraph you read, uh, uh, Mr. Datta. Was really moved, moved by your reading that passage. Thank you very much. I'm sure we all human beings have to be more empathic towards the animal. That was really well, well written, well, well put across. Thank you so much. And uh, we enjoyed going through the journey with you of your life. And I personally have been to Zorahat and Shillong both. And it's a beautiful place. Thank you so much. I hand over to the children. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was enthralling to hear you. I am sure that anyone in the audience who has not read your books yet will be motivated to grab it and read it at the earliest time possible after the panel discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. And I was really surprised that your principal has gone to a small town called Jorhat. <laughs> How did you find it, madam? Yeah, I, I love the East. I've been to uh, a lot of areas in the East. Actually, my brother-in-law, who's in the Air Force, was posted twice to Zorahat. Okay, we have a air base there. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I would now request Mr. Ranjit Lal to give us an insight into his writing and books. So, uh, would be reading to us the first chapter from his book, Bambi, Chops and Wax. Okay, hello and good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. You're very good. Okay, okay. So, um, first let me tell you how I... Uh, got into writing. Actually, it was never a career choice for me. It was 
what I call plan B. Because plan A was what I really wanted to do was be an automobile engineer and designer. But uh, unfortunately, I had a few health issues, major health issues. And the doctors had said that you just forget about that. You go and do something by which you can get a bank job or sit behind a desk the whole day from morning to evening. And that's what you should do. Now, what do you do? Luckily, I was always interested and fond of writing in school and even later on. And uh, so I said, okay, let me give a shot at this. So I started with the freelance journalism and uh, that continued for a number of years all over the place. And uh, then somebody said, why don't you write a book? So I said, book or oh, not me, no, no, no. And then I said, okay, maybe I will. Now, you know, the thing is, the beauty about writing is if you're a writer, is if you have a lot of other interests, you can put all of those interests into your writing. They're like the ingredients of a dish. I'm interested in photography. I was interested in wildlife. I was interested in birds. I was interested in dogs. I was interested in cars. And then now I'm very interested in cooking. So all these became ingredients for my books and stories. And uh, so that's how it started. Now, it started very slowly because, you know, when you suddenly decide that I'm going to be a writer, you sort of fluff your ego up a bit and say, oh, I'm a writer now. So, and so that's what happened. And what happened was I took three years over the first one third of my book that I had planned. And then one day I said, this is enough. Either I drop it or I finish it. And the next two thirds, I finished it six months. Sat down and, and I was writing with pencil, putting it on my father's also office typewriter, which was like driving a lorry, and then correcting that and then retyping it. And the third version had to be Pukka because I was not going to type it yet again. So that gave me very, uh, in, you know, I was able to then edit properly because I'm not going to retype it three times. So uh, that happened. As I was saying, you know, I had other interests like birds. I was very interested in birds. And birds used to remind me of characters, people, they were a lot like people. So my first book, which is actually for, well, both adults and children, uh, was The Crow Chronicles. And that has all bird characters and is based in the Bharatpur Bird Sanctuary what they call writing. So uh, it was a social style. It was making fun of human society, basically, and all about dictators and all the rest of it. And I had great fun. I really enjoyed it. And I was very lucky that Penguin took it and they published it. So after that, there was no going back. I set up a big decline. At around that time, we had come to Delhi. From I, I did my school and college in Delhi. And we came really, and I didn't really like the people here very much. You know, I just found them, you know, I mean, I couldn't belong with them very well. And also where I lived, which is in North Delhi, there are lots of monkeys. And they lived next to the very historical cemetery called the Nicholson Cemetery. And there was a huge party or family of monkeys living there. And they used to visit us every other day, every day. They used to get onto the balcony. They used to take the clothes off that that were drying and then model with them. They used to bounce on the car and bend the roof or take the mirror off and look at them and say, hey, is that me, such a handsome chap? Or is that some you know, stranger? So I said, Badla to Lena. Now I have to get my revenge on these guys. And uh, so I wrote another book called The Life and Times of Altu Faltu. Altu Faltu being a complete Altu Faltu monkey. And uh, the other fun part of this book was that I could model a lot of the people I didn't know on these monkeys. I made them into monkeys. So um, I did that. And of course, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. It was great fun. And my whole thing was that, you know, even if these people recognize themselves in this book, they can't take, take me to court and, and say, your lordship, I am this monkey in this book. Because uh, lordship will say, if you're saying you're a monkey, what are you complaining about? So I had great fun with that. And then the other books followed. Some were, I mean, you could say serious, but I mean, I prefer having fun in my life. Now, uh, I think a lot has been already said about why reading is so important. And the main thing is that it activates your imagination. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, you must have all read the Harry Potter books. 
And a lot of you must have seen a lot of the films also. Now, all of you who read the book first would have formed pictures in your head as to what Harry Potter looked like, what Dumbledore looked like, what the school looked like, and so on. So you had the whole story in your head. And uh, when you saw the film, that image might have been different to what the film director depicted in the film, because that was his imagination putting onto the screen. But if you saw the film first and then read the book, you would say, oh, I know exactly what Dumbledore looks like, and I know exactly what Harry Potter looks like. So I don't have, and so you don't use your imagination, which is why screen time sometimes, can, you know, it can be, it can reduce your ability to imagine. And again, you know, we've already talked about why are, why is it so important? It's important because that's where ideas are born. Because you say that, you know, uh, okay, I mean, all the inventions, as was mentioned, when was discovered by accident because the guy used his imagination to decide, you know, what if I did put this into that, what will happen? Let's see. That's because he's using his imagination. So it is extremely important. Now, the other big tool in writing is your vocabulary. And unfortunately, you know, I don't think it's so much these days. And they only want everything sort of spoon-fed to them. And even as writers, we are told that, you know, if there's a word, then if you can use a small word, use that. It's all very well. But, you know, words are like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Now, the whole puzzle, when it's finished, is a story. And each word, each piece fits into its proper place. So uh, you have to increase your vocabulary. You know, when I started, when I was in school, uh, I have an elder sister who's a teacher. Um, holidays used to come, summer holidays. You came back a huge to read and say, nice, now holidays are there, we can read it. She gave them one book and she said, put them aside. This is your reading list for the summer. And they were all big fat books. Charles Dickens, five, nothing less than 500 pages. Huge one. And she said, read it. If you have a problem, you come to me. If there's a word you don't understand, you use it. You look up the dictionary, that's what it's there for. Make a list and try and use those words in your own work. So I started, you know, at first it's a little difficult. You know, say, well, this is like work, you know, school work and blah, blah, blah. But then I found I was enjoying the story. And these were all fairly old time stories, Three Musketeers, Count of Monte Cristo, some of Charles Dickens' books, Hard Times. And I started enjoying it. And then you started reading on your own. And uh, that's how the reading habit sort of develops. Then, of course, there was the writing part. I enjoyed it. And I said, huh, now I must use all these big fancy words and uh, impress everybody. So I did that for, a, I think, a college assignment in history. Lots of big words all, all over the place, all over the essay. <laughs> and the, 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 you know, the teacher, professor, he wrote over there, lots of big words, little substance. So then I learned that, you know, you might use the big words. But you've got to be saying something too. You can't just be gassing. So that's what, you know, uh, I mean, that's what you learn with writing. And uh, as I was saying about imagination, you know, I went to one school and there was this little boy who stood up and said, why do we need imagination? Everything is available on screen. If you don't have imagination, no matter what profession you take in life, whether it's to be an accountant or whether it is to be a zoologist, you will not go very far. You will be deadly dull because you haven't thought about, hey, if I do this, what will happen? Now, you know, one of the things about story writing is the one question we are always sort of taught as writers and all that. Is you must ask the question, what if? What if this were to happen? Or what if that were to happen? And there are two elements about to writing you know, a story. One is you have your plot and one is you have your characters. Now, some writers put the plot ahead of the characters. They said it must be an adventure story, something must, action must be take place from page one to page, page 200 or whatever it is. And characters will, you know, be okay, okay, cardboard characters, they'll be there. So they write that way. Now, I prefer having characters. I think of my characters first. And I say, okay, now if I take this, these bunch, this bunch of kids and put them in this pickle or this situation, how will they react? And because each child is 
has a different nature, a different character, they will think of it each problem differently, and that's where then the in the the conflict starts. You know, the problems start also. So I prefer doing that, and that's how I generally go about my books. All the books that I've done, are first I think of the characters. Or the, and of, yes, you can change the characters as the story progresses. There's no hard and fast rule, so you have that freedom too. So that's how I sort of go about it, and I've done now I think something like 47 books, in fact. And uh, I and I must enjoy myself while writing. You know, if I get bored while I'm writing my own stuff, I said, yeah, writer is getting bored, reader so so he'll go. He'll be unconscious by the time he goes through this. So you wait, you know, you have to sort of make sure that you're enjoying what you are doing. And for me, there's nothing better than writing because, you know, I keep thinking I'm really lucky because how many people are there that who on Monday morning can't wait to get to their workstation, to their, you know, computer and start working. All, everybody is booty suji by that time. We get to the office, we have to commute, karna padega, and then we're back and all the rest of it. I don't have all that. I just, my workstation is two seconds away from my bed. So I can get up and start working. So that's a, another great advantage. And anyway, I think I've uh, guessed and talked enough. And I'll just read a bit of uh, uh, the first chapter of this book, uh, Bambi, Chops, and Wag. Now, these three guys are the three dogs we have kept over a period of 30 years, maybe. Uh, two of them were boxers, Bambi and Chops, and Wag was a white Labrador, a Labrador, who, was, I have to say, was completely not like any Labrador in the world because he was he was aggressive. He was, uh, you know, he could be dangerous also. So he was slightly one-off. But the two boxers were beautiful. And this is how we got the first uh, boxer. Now, there was me and the two of my sisters who uh, conspired to get this, you know, finally get this dog. So here goes the story. It, this, is, this is fiction. This is not, this is non-fiction. So my parents, my two sisters, Meena, 10, 20, and Mala, 12, and I, 17, were holidaying in Mahableshwar, a hill station near Bombay, in the winter of 1972, walking around the lake when the conversation turned to dogs. If, and this is a very big if, we were to keep a dog, what breed would we choose? Alas, several breeds got terribly maligned in the ensuing dis in discussion. Not Pomeranians was the unanimous verdict. They're so yappy, snappy, and they look more like cats than dogs. Yip, yap, yip, yap, yip, yap, all the time. And certainly not those silky Sydney things. More like rodents than dogs. And they only eat chicken mints. Dakshans are out too. Poor sausage dogs. When they get fat, they look like caterpillars. Gross. How about poodles? You can't be serious. They have to be taken to the hairdresser every month. What about Alsatians? They're prop dogs. Keep an Alsatian and one will dare. Come many of Alsatian walking by your side, wow. But they're supposed to be one person dogs and they need firm handling when they are pups. Instinctively, we knew that we would be unable to firmly handle any dog, even a chihuahua, forget about an Alsatian. More likely, they would firmly handle us. What about Dobermans then? They're excellent guard dogs and used by the police. But treacherous, we agreed, denouncing poor Dobermans forever. There are so many stories about Dobermans turning on their owners. No thanks. We can't have one of those. Golden Retrievers are really beautiful, but they have so much hair. Can you imagine giving them a bath? You'll have to dry them off with a hairdryer and brush out their tangles three times a day. We all turned to look, Ma look at Mala, who had very curly hair and had a tough daily battle untangling the knots. And they need to be kept in air-conditioned rooms. I suppose you'll have to do the same for copper spaniels. You have to pin their ears over their heads when they eat. And that Kim is such a foolish fellow. He always tries to climb their legs. Kim was a golden cocker that lived in our building in Bombay. But they are at convenient size, especially for flats. I think big dogs are better. How about Labradors there? They're supposed to be very intelligent and stubborn. 
somehow Labrador's didn't strike a chord with us. The boxers, they are perfect. They have such sweet, worried looking faces and big soulful eyes. And they have all those wrinkles. Look, they look ferocious, but are such softies like Cherokee. I don't think he's a proper boxer. But remember how he chased that cat with Mrs. T charging after him, screaming, Cherokee, come back here. And going all purple in the face. It was so funny. Mrs. T was a formidable English woman who lived in our building and who had confiscated several cricket balls from me and my friends, which with needless to add, we broke windows. They probably need a lot of exercise. They're so athletic, but they don't have hair. So it would be easy to look after. At this time, not for a moment did we consider the possibility of acquiring a pie dog or a party. All we knew was that we loved the way boxers looked and wanted one. The conversation lapsed into a wistful silence and probably went, up to other, went on to other subjects. Unknown to us, a seed had been sown. It lay dormant until the following March. Then our immediate neighbors in Bombay had a boxer, which their driver, who often brought her down into the garden, called it Lichmi. Her name was Lakshmi. Envious inquiries revealed that there was still one pup in the litter that needed a good home. And suddenly there was a boxer rebellion brewing in our own house, which came to a boil at the dining table one Sunday at lunchtime. The Dhars have got a new boxer pup. She's really very sweet. She's called Lechmi and plays in the garden downstairs every morning. They say there's one last pup left, Lakshmi's sister. We've never had a dog. No family is complete without a dog. You don't know what you deprived of us by not letting us keep a dog. We're willing to forgo all pocket money and birthday presents this year and next. We don't want any birthday presents if we can have a pup. We are not hungry. The rental defenses went up at once, like umbrellas in a sudden thunder shower. How can we keep a puppy? Who's going to look after it while, all, while you all are in school and college and gallivanting about town. It's only the morning that we are out. We are back in our home by lunch and someone is always at home anyway, so it won't be left alone or anything like that. We don't think it's such a good idea. It will be a lot of work. Besides, if it's a female, she'll come on heat and have puppies and we don't want to get into all that. They say it's better to keep a female than a male as your first dog. They're gentler and easier to handle. It'll be too much work. When she falls ill, you'll have to take her to the vet. We'll do all the work. We'll take her to the vet and for walks and feed her and exercise her and brush her. Oh, yes, we know what that means. But faced with three united, mutinous faces, the first cracks in the defense appear. How much do they want for the pup? We found out the prospect got bleaker. Um, only 600 rupees. Probably worth three, worth three years pocket money and birthday presents combined for all, all of us. Six hundred rupees? She's very pedigreed. But 600 rupees for a puppy? Grim faced, we went back and spoke with the Dhas, who knew uh, the owners. The scenario remained pretty dismal. They are willing to give, us, give her us for just 550, a bargain. But we'll have to tell them quickly or she'll be gone by this evening. Our combined wealth at that time had totaled around 400 rupees. If you can make up the rest, we'll forego birthday presents and pocket money. It is recovered. And so, on April Fool's Day, while Neil Diamond sang Song Song Blue, Bambi made her appearance at our home, trembling and tremulous, and blessed the floor the first tiny puddler. She was about six weeks old and smaller, the smallest of the litter, but prettier, we thought, than Lakshmi, with more worry lines on her face and neat white socks on her paws and a white map on her chest. She fitted comfortably in the hand and weighed just five pounds. I don't remember now what other names we considered, but Bambi seemed to suit her best, as she seemed timid and graceful as a deer, and, didn't, and it didn't matter that 
the original Walt Disney Bambi was a he. A few days later, we received her official pedigree papers from the Kennel Club of India and were completely blown away. Will you look at this? Meena said, shaking her head in wonder and then dissolved into giggles. Her official name is Plucky Pandora. Her sire was called Honest Iago, more giggles, and her mother was called Sabrina. She looked at Bambi. Sweetie dog, do you know what your daddy was? But look here, there's a Brutus von Tutus too. He must have been an honorable dog. And also Lady Portia. So all is not lost. Meena was a student of English Lit. We gazed at the certificate in awe. It traced her ancestry five generations back and was full of such noble and often champion souls as the English champion Burstall Jazaway, champion masterpiece of John Wynne von Prinstadt, Queen of Dahanu, Brutus von Tutus, as well as more plebeian doggies called Nita, Bina, Sally the Stylish, Jock, Panchi, Rob, Do Roy, Rob Roy, and Dolly. Who gives these dogs their names, Meena wondered, still giggling helplessly. I mean, are they nuts or what? She picked Bambi up. Did you know one of your ancestors were champion wardrobes, wild and mink, and another wardrobe stafeta bow? Maybe we should frame this certificate and put it up on the wall, I suggested. I mean, she's got better pedigree than we have. She really did. I later discovered that the, discovered that the burst style boxes belonged to a very famous German kennel while the British wardrobe boxes starred at least two famous champion sisters, Miss Mink and Miss Sable, and now the names began making sense. We need to open a file for all the documents, my father decided, and proceeded to do just that. Impressive. But we, sh we knew she came from a good, caring family when we received phone calls from the owners of her parents, followed by postcards, inquiring after her well-being and listing the shots she needed. They even suggested that in the future we should seriously consider entering her for dog shows. She was that classy. And they hoped the pup was happy. We hoped so too. We certainly were. We had no idea how to bring up, let alone train a pup. And that I think Bambi made, that made Bambi very happy indeed. She spent her first night at our house in Nina's bed. And by the morning, had piddled on her pillow and in her hair. So that's the first chapter of this book, and it goes on to uh, describe the fun we had with these three dogs. So I think I have now spoken more than enough. Very well uh, described. We are a family of dog lovers, Mr. Lal, so <laughs> we enjoy it, and we always have a Labrador in the house and also a German Shepherd. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very well described. Thank you. Over to children, please. Thank you, sir. Hearing the writer reading his book makes the reader understand the details of his writing. We all greatly enjoyed your reading and would further read the whole novel in detail. Once again, thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, we are going to have the question and answer session. Uh, the first question will be asked by Mustafa. So, Mustafa, you can pose your question now. So, my question is to uh, Arup, sir. Sir, do you carry out any research before writing a novel? Uh, I think... That's half the work, at least, for writing any kind of book. Research is the most important aspect. You see, it's not only for adult writing, but also for young adults. I think the amount of research I do for my adventure novels for young adults. I don't think I do it for my adult books. Let me give you one example. I have written an adventure story set in Arunachal among the Khamti tribe. 
Now, the Khamdi tribe are, you know, very expert at elephant trapping. Now, in order to get an authentic background, I went to Chaukham village, which is the place where most of the Khamdis live. And I stayed there for a few weeks just to get the feel of the environment. Also learn how elephants are actually caught. Now, mind you, that was not the elephant catching season. So what they did was they enacted a mock elephant trapping set up for me. You know, how a kunki is, what kind of things are put on the kunki, how the trapper, what kind of a lasso he has, and they actually made a mock-up. Anyway, to cut short my thing, what you said is true. For every book of mine, I do a uh, huge amount of research. Thank you, sir. That was uh, really interesting. The next question is from Shweta. Shweta, you can ask your question now. Good evening, sir. My question is for Arup, sir. So, if you could uh, become any book character for a day, who would you choose to be and why from the books you have wrote? Again, I couldn't get your question, please. Yes, sir. So, if you could become any book character for a day from the books you wrote, who would you choose to be and why? Okay. Uh, well, I think I would be, I'd like to be a character I had created called Ramu. Now, that is from the book called The Blind Witness. You see, Ramu is blind. And I had always thought, you know, what kind of a world does a blind person live in? Now, Ramu had witnessed a murder, but he had witnessed it through his hearing, not through his eyes. And ultimately, nobody believed when he said that he knew who the murderer could be anyway. Now, that has a, some kind of a background to this novel. He said, while I was teaching in a college before I became a full-time writer, I had met a blind boy, a student, and he had a kind of board with him, also a needle and paper, and he would punch out holes in the paper in Braille. So one day he came to me and he asked me, the sir, you speak so fast, I can't keep up with you. I can't make notes. So could you speak slightly slowly so that I can keep up with you? I said, sorry, with this class has around 120 students. And for one student, I cannot slow down what I say. But what I'll do is after classes are over, you come and sit with me for half an hour and I will try to repeat what I have said for your benefit. And for the next few months, I had a very intimate relation with this boy. And suddenly, you know, I became aware of what kind of a environment, what kind of a world a blind individual lives in. So if I had to choose a character, mind you, it's all a figment of imagination. It's not in real terms. I would choose to be Ramu, the blind boy. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Now, I would request Malay to pose his question. Malay, you can ask your question. Good evening, everyone. My question is for Mr. Ranjit Lal. Sir, according to you, are there any particular traits a young and aspiring writer should have? Uh, well, the main trait is that you should love reading. Because if you want to write, you have to read maybe a thousand times more than you write. Because that's, as I said, it improves your vocabulary. It gives you a vision into different people's worlds. And it helps you to form an opinion that you can then put into your own writing. So you have to read and read a lot, as much as you can. Yes, every book that you open is sometimes difficult to start. Because it's like, you know, it's like when you guys in a new class, you enter the new class and you see all these new faces around you and you wonder now how are these kids are going to be, what are they going to be like, are they going to be friendly, are they going to, be, are they going to take my lunch away. So, uh, but then gradually you get to know them and that's when you get into, you know, and then enjoy it. And once you're hooked into reading, I think they, you'll be hooked for life. But you've got to get hooked, you've got to read a lot. And uh, it improves your vocabulary, improves the way you think, and it opens your, your vision up totally. So that's what you must really do. Thank you, sir. I'm sure that your words will inspire all the young writers. The next question is from Astha. Over to you, Astha. Good evening, everyone. My question is to Ranjit, sir. Sir, how do you bring alive the characters in your book without any illustrations? Uh, well, one trick of the trick is you have a lot of dialogue in your story. Because the moment your characters start talking to each other, you they start becoming characters. So I start a lot of my books with dialogue. Somebody has something, somebody is either taken an offense at or agreed or not, and, and then the story continues. And I enjoy writing, I mean, dialogue a hell of a lot. I love it. Because you can, you, you can then explain what you want to say without actually describing it. You know, they always say you have to sh show rather than tell, rather than give a big lecture that this is the way it was and all that. Have your characters say that. Uh, let the characters ask questions. Now I told you about, you know, uh, difficult words. Now supposing you have two characters and one is one uses all these fancy words and the other one immediately says, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? So the guy has to then explain that this is what I meant. And that's how the word gets explained without, you know, saying that, you know, this is what the word means kind of a thing. So that's how I do it. And uh, it's just the characters that start talking and the story moves on. So that's how I sort of go about, uh, uh, you know, putting in characters and stuff and, you know, explaining about them. Thank you, sir. Your tips would surely be helpful while writing. Okay, I'm just going to jump in here. I know it's been, it's been really fascinating and we have, you know, I wish we had more time and we can go on and on and on. But I think uh, in the interest of time and the promise that I made to everybody, uh, let's keep last two questions uh, from the children to, um, uh, to both our authors. Uh, and also then at the end, uh, Mr. Dave Nair, who uh, has been my teacher once, is also here and he's uh, joined in this conversation. Um, and Ranjit, sir, actually, I should ask you to you know, connect uh, with him offline because I think he's a, um, as enthusiastic a birder as you are. Uh, but let's quickly just get two questions uh, here from the students and then uh, we will pass it on to uh, the sir for the final question. Sure, sir. Mansi, please pose your question. Uh, yes, sir. So my, uh, so my question is to you, Ranjit, sir. So we know that uh, books are our best friends, but these days books are competing more and more with digital platforms like cartoons and games. They are becoming more popular. So, sir, how do we inculcate ourselves to read and realize that reading is more important than these things? 
Well, it's uh, basically it's just your self discipline. You have to tell yourself this a lot. That no, I must. I'd rather read a book than watch this thing on TV or uh, get into social media and all that. It's just your discipline. You have the the, the thing is that once you get into reading, then it'll automatic. Then you'll automatically do it. But that first step of actually getting into reading, I feel sorry for you guys because there's so many things to distract you with. We never had that when I was never had that when I was a child. We just had books. That was it. So you either took it and or left it. You didn't have anything else. But you guys get very easily just. And if you see all the other media, it's it's like a shortcut. You don't think. You just you know type something out or whatever it is, and you don't use your imagination. And everything's on a picture. Is has a picture. So you're not again using your imagination. You're looking at the pictures. So the best best thing is to just self discipline every day i will read so much and once you start getting interesting book read things about which you are interested you know then that will take you on a further thank you sir uh, i request dev sir to please pose a question uh, yes dev sir over to you So we can't hear you. Uh, you might be on mute. Uh, can, if you can turn on your video as well, so people, then everyone can see you as well. Uh, so you should be able to do it on your own, sir. Um, I'm not sure if. Yeah, done. Okay. Again. So, I'll, can you hear me, Arjun? Yes, yes, sir. We can hear you now. so uh, it was really uh, great listening to arup sir and to ranjit and uh, as you said i'd love to get in touch with ranjit after the session and uh, uh, i have to of his book in my collection uh, arup sir it was wonderful hearing you and uh, more so as i am a product of st edmunds college shillong and uh, the poet Anun ananya guha was my senior in college and yeah uh, i know him uh, right sir i thought you must be knowing him i think he was heading the igloo regional center in uh, jorat some years ago and uh, yeah he is i think he is still doing so now right sir right so i left shillong in 17 sir and i could connect with uh, deeply connect with what you said about the alienation of the northeast and uh, it was wonderful hearing you and i'll be in touch with you uh, sir uh, besides you is there could you recommend one or two writers from the northeast for the teenagers here uh, besides your works uh, i mean i know a few but then they may not be uh, very suitable for a teenage audience a young audience uh, so if in case you have some writers in mind which you would recommend to the book lovers of colonel's academy uh, it would I be one today why don't you switch on your video also so that they can see you okay i thought it's on No, no, you no. can. No, it's not on. It it's on. Uh, it's on, Mama. It's on. Yeah. I'm um, not able to see it. Actually. I'm not able to see Dave. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just switch on the video. I'll try it again. Yes, please. Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, touch the mic. You are switching on and off the mic. On the other side is on the on the other side is the video. Yeah, yeah. I've I've switched on both. Both are on. The mic. Okay. So, uh, have you logged in from two different things, sir? Eh? No. Okay. So then I just saw on another device which Anuba has, and your video is visible, but for me your video is not visible. So I don't know. No, There must be this is the beauty. This is the beauty of technology. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know, uh, Arup sir. Can you see uh, there, sir, or, or Ranjit sir? Can I, you see I can just see a, you know, some kind of a painter sketch. sketch. I see the sketch as well. <laughs> I think he has a beard. He has a beard and also wears spectacles. That's right, sir. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> and thanks to the pandemic, I am so lazy. I'm not been shaving lately, also. So, <laughs> so. Let me try again, sir. And because when I unmuted myself, it worked. And same with the video. 
No, I just saw on uh, Anurag's phone it was working. So this is obviously some technical thing which. Uh, right. Right. So let's not get lost in that. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Arup sir, uh, back to you, sir. Uh, yeah. Are there any uh, writers from the northeast you would you could recommend for our youngsters here? Uh, actually, not many right for right. young adults. Right, sir. Right. Uh, most we have our, very. Uh, we have a group of very talented writers and right. poets. Yeah. But I think most of them write for what you call. Uh, adults. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, writing for young adults, I don't mm. think we have measured up to the kind of caliber, perhaps which you might desire. But I'll have to give it a thought and so find out. I. So will I. And if I find anything, I'll share with the students of Colonel Zakaki. And uh, yes, def definitely. I'll also be in touch with you, sir. And we have some powerful writers in regional language. Right, sir. In our case, it is Assam's case, Ahomia. Right, sir. And the other seven sisters, their own language. We have right. very powerful writers for young adults in those regional languages. Right, sir. But unfortunately, not many of them have been translated into English or right. adequately translated. So right, I right. cannot often make any kind of recommendation right now. Right, sir. So, Nika, I'll also search, and if I find anything, I'll share with the students. So that oh, sure. Sure. Book lovers yeah, here. Definitely. Thank you very much, sir. Looking forward to okay. Thank you, Dave. More of your works and getting in touch. Right, back to Mansi then. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was indeed a wonderful session, which inspired all with your knowledge and experiences to encourage and motivate the writer within us. Now, in the end, I would request our respected director, sir, to please give the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Okay, once again, good evening, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the entire Colonel's Academy family, I want to thank uh, Mr. Arup Tata and Mr. Ranjit Lal for joining us today. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you both with us. Uh, I was happily inspired and uh, excited to hear about the things that you said. Um, like uh, you heard my mom talk about the fact that we grew, we've grown up with dogs and I remember the first time we got a lab, uh, she was called Laika. Uh, and again, she was called Laika because the certificate that we got from the Chemical Club of India, uh, along with the five generation history of the dog, uh, said her name has to be Laika. So yes, I, I, I could totally relate to what you were saying. Uh, and, uh, and Arup sir spoke about the importance of creativity, imagination, and how one, you know, how one book, uh, leave alone a book, how one page of a book can transport you to uh, you know, a land far away. Uh, I have grown up reading books all through uh, from a very young age, sir, and I could completely relate to some of the things that were said. I remember, you know, I, the, the fondest memories I have is when I was in grade eight, uh, and we were, my father was posted in a very small town called Butlo, which is between, somewhere between Pathankot and Dalhousie. It's a small army town where, uh, other than the army, there wasn't really anything else uh, to do. So there were only two things that we did as children. Um, one was to get in touch with nature. And I remember endless evenings and afternoons of following streams uh, to different, you know, across the hills, climbing trees. Um, and the second thing you could do was read books. And again, I remember spending entire summer vacations locked up in a room under a bed. And the story behind that is another officer in the, in the unit had a whole collection of all the Tintins and the Asterix comics <laughs> in a box under his bed. Uh, so the challenge I used to have was to get inside that bedroom, under that bed, yeah. and spend <laughs> as much time hidden away there as I could to read as many of those as possible. And they were very possessive about it because in those times, and I'm talking, you know, early 80s, uh, mid 80s, where they were very, very particular about that collection that they had, not many people had the entire collection of Asterix and Tintin uh, 
And, and to me, you know, my my imagination of how the Inca civilization, for example, stems from the the Tintin adventures that I've read uh, when he went exploring the Inca Trail. Uh, and you know, it it only grew. I mean, I have whether it was Agatha Christie or Enid Blyton or uh, you know. For even uh, Swami from the Malguri days was a character that I, I would, you know, when somebody asked you a question, which character would you be? And my answer probably would have been Swami from Malguri days because I think he had the most interesting life that I could <laughs> imagine when I read uh, the, the Malguri days uh, series. So yes, it, you know, I mean, it, it, to me, I went back to my childhood, uh, and, and uh, unfortunately, in, we don't get much time. Uh, these days to, to be able to read and, and that's one of my regrets uh, uh, but thank you so much for joining us thank you for inspiring us uh, I just want to uh, you know uh, just quote Anne Lamott who is an American author who says that for some of us books are as important as almost anything else on earth what a miracle it is that out of these small flat rigid squares of paper Unfolds world after world after world. Worlds that sing to you, comfort and quiet or excite you. Books help us understand who we are and how we are to behave. They show us what community and friendship mean. They show us how to live and die. And I think very nicely in that one paragraph, she's defined how I, my experience with books has been. Uh, and I would strongly encourage children to read as much as they can, uh, because I think the first step towards maybe even if you want to take up writing as a career, as, as uh, Mr. Lal was saying, is to, is to read. And Tony Morrison said, if there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. With that, I'm not going to take any more time. Uh, once again, thank you, uh, Mr. Datta, and thank you, Mr. Lal. We would love for you to remain in touch with us. We would love to have you again uh, on some other occasion talking to our students. Uh, and uh, personally, I would love to continue to be inspired by you. With that note, I thank all of you uh, for joining the session. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as we come to the end of today's panel discussion, let's sing our school song, which was written by our founder father, late Colonel Fateh Jang Bahadur.
so we end this panel discussion here thank you everyone stay home and stay safe i request all of you to please log out now thank you thank you